Father in heaven, come to you in the name of your son, Jesus. And God, I, I pray this morning that you would, that you would send your spirit in here, God, and that you would convict us of our sins. And God, that you would lead us into righteousness. We love you for who you are and for what you've done. I need your help this morning, so God, please speak through me. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, my sister was an exceptional child, right? Um, she was smart. She was good in school. She was a beauty queen. Um, she was in every way uh, the perfect child. She was the favorite. Um, I was a little bit different than her. Uh, I was smart, mouth. Um, I did not do good in school. Uh, my sister graduated in the honor roll. Uh, I did not graduate with honors. In fact, the only time that I ever got recognized in school was when the principal would recognize me walking into his office because I had done something that I shouldn't. Um, it's, it's sort of like an old Baptist pastor I heard, heard say once, uh, I didn't graduate cum laude, I graduated thank the laude. <laughs> um, I was different than my sister. We were similar in some ways, but don't be fooled. My sister, though she seemed like she was the perfect angel, she was no perfect angel. Um, as legend would have it, um, one time uh, when I'm a baby and I'm crying, my mom goes to get me a bottle, and this perfect child grabs her glass of iced tea and dumps it on my head to shut me up. <laughs> this perfect child. Uh, when her brother wanted to ride the seesaw with her, she did what any perfect child would do. She went as hard and fast as she could just to see how far her little brother could fly through the air and skip across the concrete. I bet if I was to go around the room this morning, some of you uh, could relate to having the perfect sibling, right? It's easy to tell... Uh, our children apart. We have our good kids and we have our bad kids. We have our obedient kids and we have our disobedient kids. Born from the same parents and yet totally different in certain ways, right? If you're like Heidi and I, we had one child. Some of you might be like this. We had one child, Clara, and it just so happens that she was really good, and so we thought, why, why would we try this again? <laughs> I, I, just couldn't, I just couldn't imagine having, having a better, better child, and that's a grace from God. Um, if, they, if she would have turned out like me, whew. It's easy to tell the difference between a good child and a bad child. I wonder if it's easy to tell the difference between a child of God and a child of the devil. That's what we're going to see today. Our text is 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 28. We're going to continue our study in this, in this awesome letter by the Apostle John. So this is what it says. You can follow along. This is the Word of God. And now, little children, abide in Him, so that when He appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from Him in shame at His coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called the children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us 
is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he's been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. We're in our fifth week together in our study of of this wonderful letter by the Apostle John, and, and we entitled this series Abide. And we've given you this charge to abide, to forcefully remain or to cling to Jesus. So when John wrote this letter, he wrote this to a whole bunch of of Christians who were dealing with uh, intense persecution. They were dealing with false teachers and false doctrine. And, And probably the biggest thing that John was facing, the biggest false doctrine that John was dealing with at this time was was the issue of the deity of Christ, right? Could God, could Jesus be fully God and fully man? Is that possible? And so that's that's really where John begins this letter. And so I just want to give you a a quick Cliff Notes read-through of where we've been in this letter to, to kind of build to where we are today. And so here's some of the stuff that John says. He says, he begins his letter, we saw Jesus from the beginning. From the beginning of of creation, Jesus has always been there. And John says, we saw him, we touched him, we heard him. He was with the Father and he was revealed, he was made manifest to us. This Jesus is the Son of God, and in Him is eternal life. And you and us as readers, we need to hear that and believe that so that our joy may be complete. Not only this, but God is light. And those who walk in the light, they belong to Him, and they have fellowship with Him. John goes on to say, don't lie about walking in the light Don't lie about being sinful, but know that as a believer, if you sin, that Jesus is just and he's right, and God is just and he's right to forgive us of our sins because of the blood of his son. The son was the satisfying payment, that propitiation that we heard about um, for not only for your sins, but for everyone's sins who would ever believe in Jesus by faith. He's our advocate. He's our helper. He's our intercessor. He's the one that stands between us and an all-holy God. And then we get to chapter 2, and I love the way that John says this. First John chapter 2, verse 6, he says, Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. If you look like Jesus, then you act like Jesus. When people see you, how do they see you walking? Do you look like someone that's walking with Jesus? And so from there, John just lays out the the ways that a Christian ought to carry himself. You ought to be able to see this in their love for others. You ought to be able to see this in the way that they let go of the world and worldly things. You can tell them because 
those type of, because Christians are aware of people that don't, uh, that don't believe what we've taught you. The things that John and Paul and all of the, we know what they've taught us. People who don't follow Christ are in fact anti-Christ. They don't follow Christ. They are against Christ. They don't love others the same way. They don't walk in light. They claim to know Christ, but there is no love of God and there's no understanding of God. And one evidence of the way that you know them is because instead of remaining in the body of Christ, they leave and they become apostate Christians, non-believers. Another way you see that is that they deny the Christian faith. And finally, they try to lie to you through teaching you something that isn't true about Christ. And John says, but you're different. As Christians, you are different because you have the indwelling Holy Spirit inside you. And so you don't need to be taught by someone else because that's what the Holy Spirit is there for. It teaches you. It helps reveal things to you, things that are true, things that are true about Christ, true about God, true about who you really are, and true about what you know to be truth. And so that brings us to our text that we're in today. And so I want to ask you this question this morning, and then I'm going to try to answer it through our text. Here's the question. How do you know if you're a child of God? How do you know that you are a child of God? And before I show you um, from the Bible how you can know that, I want to... I want to start by saying that today I'm going to say some things that are going to come off very, uh, very hard. And they might even be offensive to you in some ways. But just know this, that God doesn't put preachers in your life so that they'll tickle your ears and make you have a warm, fuzzy feeling about yourself. He, he puts preachers in your life to teach you the truth about God and the truth about his son Jesus, to teach you the word of God and the spirit of God through the power of God in order to lead you to God so that you'll cry out to him and be saved. Paul, Paul says it like this in Romans chapter 10. He says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And he says, but how will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. God sends people in your lives to preach to you. It's, it's to give you good news. And at the same time, it's to teach you truth. And sometimes that truth can hurt. So how can you know that you are a child of God? You know, as, as human beings, we face all types of doubts and insecurities, right? We're, we're, we doubt ourselves. We doubt our abilities. We doubt um, our, our jobs. We're insecure about things like the way that we look, the way that we dress, the way that people think about us. We're insecure about things like those, including our finances. And so, and so we have all these insecurities, all these doubts as, as human beings. And as Christians, we have these same doubts. We have these same struggles. But on top of that, on top of all of those things, if, if you've walked with God for any amount of time, uh, my guess is, is that at some point, and if you haven't had this happen yet in your Christian life, you, you probably will. At some point, you're going to have doubts and insecurities about your faith, about your walk with God, about is God real? Can I really trust that God loves me, that I'm really his child? Am I really and truly saved? Or can we even have any type of security like that? You know, if you're like me... <laughs> 
man, sometimes I just need to know that I'm, that I'm a child of God, that God really loves me, that, that he's there for me, that I'm saved. Am I a child of God? Imagine, if you would, that you're living in a time period that, that sharing your faith with someone could get your head cut off. Imagine, if you would, that if sharing your faith could get you crucified upside down, could get you, if you were John, thrown into a cauldron of boiling oil. And I say, imagine, if you could, because if we're honest here in the United States, we're not, we're not really dealing with those things, right? Right? Like, here in the States, we have freedoms that, that we just take for granted a lot. Like, for us, something that, that we might struggle with is maybe having to, to stand up in front of people and, and share our testimony. Right? That could be a real struggle for us. And maybe we could even take it a step farther. Maybe, maybe it would make us uncomfortable as Christians uh, if we had to stand up for things that we knew uh, were wrong or things that weren't of God. Things like maybe abortion. You know, that's one of those words that we kind of stray away from because uh, we don't want to be offensive to each other. You know, things like homosexuality or what what about government um, corruption right these these are struggles that we deal with we're not worried about getting our heads chopped off for sharing the gospel and so in a way we have to imagine what this is like these things are going on in the world still it's just that it, it's not happening at that level yet here in the United States. And so, so that's why we kind of have to imagine that these things um, really happen. We can only imagine to be a child of God in the time that John was writing this letter. See, when John wrote this letter, he was writing to give encouragement to his brothers and sisters who were dealing with intense persecutions in order to give them hope about the eternal life that Jesus has for them. This eternal life that comes through faith in Jesus. He wants to give them security about their questionable futures. And he wants to remind them about truths that they've been taught about Jesus. And so here in this section of the letter that we just read, that's what he's doing. And he, he John, explains very clearly... We're going to see it just, it's super clear what a child of God is and what a child of the devil are. And, and so hear me say this this morning. There are only two groups of people, right? There are children of God and there are children of the devil. And sometimes I read this and I'm like, man, this is... This is harsh. I don't even know if I'm saved sometimes when I read some of this. And yet, this is an encouragement to his brothers and sisters. This is an encouragement to you. So, I'm kind of a guy that likes to start with the bad news and then get to the good news. And so, we're going to talk about the children of the devil first. Who are the children of the devil? Of the devil. John is, is crystal clear here. Okay, he makes the same point three different times. So if you got a Bible, I, I just want you to look at this. It's, it's not going to be up there, and that's my fault. I apologize. But in verse 4, I'll read verse, this is what he says. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. In verse 8, he says, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. You say the beginning of what? The beginning of time. If you go all the way back to the garden, Satan is there and he's lying. He is a liar 
and he's the father of lies. That's what we're going to hear in just a minute. In verse 10, he says it again, By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. So that, like, you can't get much more clear than that, right? Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. And, and so I was thinking about this, and I thought, you know, there's some texts in the Bible that might help us to understand this just a little bit better, this distinction. So in John chapter 8, Jesus is speaking to his fellow Jews, okay? Jews thought that they were people of God, children of God, because they were born into the family of God through their father, Abraham. Right. And so they all believe that if you're born, if you're a descendant of Abraham, that you must be a child of God. And so this is what Jesus lays out for them. And so the crowd answered him, starting verse 39, they answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You're doing the works your father did. They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? And then he answers this question. He says, it's because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he's a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God, hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is because you are not of God. So Jesus clearly lays out, Hey, you think that your father is Abraham? But what you're doing is a direct indication that you're actually a child of the devil. Paul says it like this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. And you, and that you is a universal you, were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, that's Satan, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. And so we have Jesus saying, here's the difference between the child of God, child of Satan. You have Paul who says that all of us at one time, before we came to Christ, we're walking with the prince of the power of the air. And we were doing the desires of the flesh. And so my question and your question should be, so what are the, what are the desires of the flesh? What's that mean? Well, Paul tells us in Galatians 5 what the desires or the works of the flesh are. He says they're evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So, listen to me. If you 
are in blatant, unrepentant, you don't care that you're sinning, you don't care who it affects, you don't care, uh, you've convinced yourself that somehow what you're doing, it's not that bad, and you've, you, you've continuously do this, and there is no conviction to what you're doing in your sin, whatever that sin might be, you need to hear that that clearly indicates that you are not a child of God. Okay, if you are practicing sin, if you are walking in unrighteousness, then you are not a child of God. And like Paul says to the church in Colossae, on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. And I, you know, sometimes we don't say those things enough. That, that, that if you come in here and, and you get filled by, by a feeling or whatever, and, and you, you know that you came in this morning and you're in blatant, unrepentant sin, that somehow God is going to grade on a curve in your life because you did a few things that were good. And he's not like that. You're either a child of God or you're not. And it's a dangerous thing to fall into the hands of a living God. But there is good news. See, we don't have to stay there. We have a God who's patient, and his patience is meant to lead you to repentance. And John says there is another group, and John is writing to this other group. And this other group is the children of God. Who are the children of God? In verse 29, a child of God practices righteousness. In verse, chapter 3, verse 1, a child of God is not, is not known by the world. That means that when the world sees you, they don't really recognize that you have the indwelling Holy Spirit that he just talked about in you. A child of God, verse 3, hopes in Jesus. A child of God abides in Jesus. A child of God, verse 8 and 9, does not practice sinning. In fact, John says he cannot keep on sinning. And then verse 10, a child of God loves his brother. So I could preach like the rest of the year on what being a child of God means. Um, John tells us how we can know that we're children of God. He says in verse 29, You know that he, Jesus, is righteous, and anyone that is practiced that practices righteousness has been born of him. Verse 5, you know he appeared to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. You know that about Jesus, that he came and lived a perfect life, that there wasn't any sin, he never sinned, and that there was no sin in him. And that's why he was risen from the dead, because he didn't sin. Verse 9, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. And so, so here's the thing I need you to focus on, on these three verses. He says this, this phrase, born of God, born of him. If you're in Christ, it's because you have been born again. And, and this is so miraculous that, that he, he adds this in, sometimes we gloss over it, but I want to point it out. He says, God's seed abides in him. That word seed in the Greek, it means offspring, it means descendants. And there's a couple of verses that this is used in the, in the Bible, and, and I just want to point out one to you because it fits um, well with, with the thought that we've been going 
with. Um, the Jews thought that they were the children of God because they were Abraham's offspring. And in the book of Romans, in chapter 9, this is what Paul says about that. He says, It's not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. That's that word, the same word, seed. He says this means that it's not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. Another place that this word is used is in Genesis 3 when, when God tells Satan, he says, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring, Satan, and her offspring, the offspring of Eve. See, Paul makes distinctions the same way that John does, the same way that Jesus does regarding God's children. So this is important. I, I want you to, to get this, that, that if you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus, it's because you've been born again, right? You're different. You've been supernaturally, through the power of the Holy Spirit, born of God. Originally, you were, like Paul says, dead in your sins and trespasses. That's, that's Ephesians 2 that we just read. That's who you were. But God, being rich in mercy... Because of the great love with which he loved us caused us to be born again. Jesus explains the new birth like this, okay? I want you guys to see this with your eyes. Jesus answered them. So Nicodemus comes to him in the night. Nicodemus is a ruler of the Jews. He says, we know that you're a man that's been born. Or we know that you're a man that's come from God because nobody can do the things that you're doing. And Jesus to Nicodemus, this ruler of the Jews, says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Like, that's a legitimate question, right? How am I supposed to be born again? I've already been born. And Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So you can't enter it and you can't see it if you're not born again. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that what is, which is born of the spirit is spirit. Don't marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Again, just a few chapters before this, John says this, speaking about Jesus in John chapter 1, verses 10 through 13. He says, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, to them he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And so he tells us that if you are born of God, we do that by believing in him. So our faith in Jesus, our belief that he is who he says he is, that he did what he said he did. That faith is what makes us children of God. If you're a born-again believer, you're distinct from the rest of the world. Like you could have been 
the worst person on the planet. Okay, the most vile person. No one in here has been that guy or that girl. Right? But you, you can come into a church and you can be a child of Satan and yet through the preaching of the gospel and through the preaching of the word of God you can hear that you can be convicted of your sin and you can confess those and you can be changed. And you're not like that anymore. And if, you, if I was to go around the room and ask everybody here, hey, how, what were you like before you accepted Jesus? Man, we would hear all types of testimonies, right? For some of us, uh, man, I was, I was a drug addict or, or I was, you know, I, I was an abuser of, of some type. Maybe I grew up in a, a horrible circumstances. Maybe you lived like me and, and you grew up in a decent household and let, yet you still um, became a, a rebel, a child of Satan. You just go off and you do any number of sins, sins that we listed earlier. I, I, I don't know your background. I, I don't know all of your testimonies. But I know this, that if you are a child of God, that you don't look the same as the world. You look different. You walk like Jesus. You look like someone who is abiding in Jesus because you love Jesus. I doubt that anyone in here was the most vile person in the world. But some of you in here might think that there's this particular sin that you committed, this particular sin that you've done that keeps you out of the grace of Jesus, out of the grace of God. Like, like maybe, uh, maybe at some point you've You've cheated on your spouse, and there's just, you just feel like there's just no way that God could forgive that. And so you, you don't want to confess that, and you, and you don't want to make that known because you just, you've got it burnt in your head that there's no way that I can be saved. There's no way I'm a child of God. I'm the world's greatest sinner, and everything that Jesus did on the cross, it's, a, it's enough for somebody else, but not for me. And, and if that's you this morning, man, will you, will you just hear me when I say, you cannot out the cross. That what Jesus did on the cross is enough. His work was enough. And by putting your faith in him, putting your trust in him, he makes those sins go away. I'm not the guy that I used to be. But I'm also not the guy that I'm going to be. Like my sins are forgiven. I've let them go. And I don't feel the condemnation for it anymore. Because Jesus, he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone. Behold, the new has come. I don't look the same anymore. I was not a good human being for a long time. But I can say with full confidence this morning that I'm a child of God and I've been forgiven. And if you're a child of God, you can say that with confidence that you are his child, not because of anything that you've done, but because of everything that he did. You're distinct from the rest of the world. Jesus says this. He says, you'll be able to tell a tree by its fruit. You're either going to bear good fruit as a child of God, 
or you're going to bear bad fruit as a child of the devil. Let's pray. Father, you are good and you are kind. You're slow to anger and you abound in steadfast love and faithfulness. God, none of us are righteous. The Bible says none are righteous, no, not one. But God, through the work of Jesus, through his life, through his burial, through his resurrection, by faith in that, God, we are made righteous. We are made right. We are justified by our faith. And so, God, I I just, I beg you this morning that that you would convict us of our sin and that you would lead us not into temptation, but you would deliver us from the evil one. God, you are good and you're holy and you call us to be holy. So God, we need your help. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if, if you've not ever been born again if you've never repented of your sins and you've never trusted in Jesus then then today right now that it's your opportunity okay God is patient and he's loving and he's kind and his patience like I said earlier is meant to lead you to repentance and so if you are in the children of the devil this morning you don't have to stay there This is an invitation time. And what that means is you have been convicted of your sins by the power of the Holy Spirit and you feel a burden for that and you don't want to hold on to those anymore. And you can let them go. And this is the time for you. Listen, nobody in here was like Paul. He didn't stone or kill Christians by the thousands. Nobody was in here like that. God saved him. Made him the greatest missionary probably that the world ever knew. Nobody in here on the night of Jesus' death looked Jesus in the face and said, I don't know that guy. After he'd walked with him for three years. That's what Peter did. I don't know that guy. I don't love him. And then Jesus looks at him later and he says, after he's come back, he says, you love me, Peter? You don't have to be perfect to fit into this family. In fact, if you were perfect, man, you wouldn't fit in at all here. Because there's a whole bunch of imperfect people There's a whole bunch of people that might have been worse sinners than even you. You don't have to be a child of Satan. You can be a child of God. In fact, there's always room. Anyone that calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That is a promise that you can keep. So if today is your day to stop following the desires of your flesh and you want to come to Christ, I will be right up here and I will pray with you. And if you need prayer for something that's going on in your life, I'll be right up here and I'll pray with you. Whatever your need is, we're going to sing this song. I love this song. Because it's true for me, and I hope that the words to this song this morning are true to you. Let's sing.